It's a blessing to welcome all of you to our live stream worship on this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. Below you will find a link to a worship bulletin and below that a link to our online giving. Our guest preacher this week is the Reverend Joseph Butler, who is the curate at Christ Church Blacksburg and the chaplain to our Aiden community of young adults. Our guest musician is Sumner Jenkins, who is the organist and choir director at St. Paul's in Lynchburg. Our worship begins with a penitential order on page 351 of the Book of Common Prayer. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy is forever. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise. But among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Here ends the reading. Let us read together Psalm 51, verses 1 through 13. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. 
Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin and I shall be pure. Wash me and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. A reading from Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord our Christ. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come into this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ.
Now my soul is troubled. Of all the wisdom that Jesus speaks throughout the gospel, that single sentence is probably the most relatable thing Jesus ever said. Indeed, now my soul is troubled. Is your soul troubled? How could it not be? Look and see the trouble all around us. It seems the troubles are endless. For all the strife and division in our society today, the one thing that we all readily agree on is that we are all troubled. What troubles your soul, of course, depends on your priorities. And we get stuck quite hard in parsing out solutions to our troubles, which in and of itself is troubling, but we have no trouble in admitting that we are troubled and are living in troubling times. Though what is most troubling about our state of affairs is perhaps not our circumstances and challenges, but how we understand them. Something very dangerous has been going around lately. It's this idea that our current troubles are unprecedented. That humanity has never before faced such troubles, and that we are completely on our own to solve them. This is dangerous because it instills in us a sense of fear, of powerlessness, because these systemic issues are so large that no single person can make any meaningful change, or everything's so broken, why should I bother? Or those people's beliefs threaten my beliefs, but nothing we do seems to be able to stop them. This idea that everything that is happening to us now is unheard of, is born out of arrogance, and designed to make us fear and hate one another. Why? For views, clicks, ads, profit, and power. We get overwhelmed by our troubles. And when we get overwhelmed, we simplify, we generalize, and surrender our agency to anyone who promises to solve our troubles for us. But we cannot let ourselves be deceived. The troubles we face are nothing new to humanity. Why are we surprised to face a plague when they have been challenging society since the beginning of civilization? Why are we surprised at the spread of disinformation, of polarization, of wealth inequality, of injustice? It is simply arrogance. With our growth in material wealth, earthly power, and technology, we became complacent and let ourselves be led to believe that we advanced beyond our barbaric ancestors and that the world was simply going to keep improving without intentional effort. Because we had become so accustomed to this vision of ourselves and unstoppable progress, we forgot our place as stewards of God's creation. So now, everything is unprecedented. Because we forgot our past and God in favor of an idolized version of ourselves, when things go wrong, we feel helpless and alone. That is trouble. What are we to do with these troubled souls and this troubled world? Are we to retreat, to hoard for our sense of security, or beg to have this cup taken from us? Should we say, Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that we have come to this hour, to glorify God's name. And now that the scales are falling from our eyes and we see that we are no, not alone, we can see our true calling and what will ultimately will save us from our troubles, the gospel. When the gospel of loving God and our neighbor is so written on our hearts that the greatest and the least embody it, then will our troubles cease. The fruits of our labor will be the vision of the new covenant proclaimed in Jeremiah. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach each other, or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This answer, of course, is by no means unprecedented. This has been the message of the Church for millennia. We have proclaimed the name of Jesus across time, across station and continent. It is nearly impossible to find someone who hasn't had know the Lord preached at them. Yet our souls are still troubled. Where are the fruits of our labor? Though we have sown the words of the gospel, the stories, and even some of the wisdom, we have been content to remain single grains. 
As a body of Christ, we have filled our grain houses with prestige, social capital, cultural influence, wealth, and power. And yet for all of our power and influence in society, we forgot this lesson from Christ. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. We have been gripping onto our grains, collecting them, storing them, never letting go. And so, there is no fruit. Rather than asking ourselves, what more do we need to do to stop our troubles? The question we need to ask is, what needs to die so that we can bear fruit? Our arrogance? Our inordinate love of power and wealth? Our image of ourselves and our prestige? Our image of our enemies and those who still fear in us? Our jealousy and belief in scarcity? And most of all, our belief that solving these troubles can be accomplished alone. We need to let these die for us to bear fruit. In these past days, the perception of Christians is not that they are gospel bearers, but people so hell-bent on keeping their influence in society that they are willing to go against the very principles of loving God and loving neighbor for the sake of maintaining that power. When people tell me why they left the church, it's almost never because of intellectual or theological considerations, but the behavior of Christians. And as much as we like to believe as a denomination that we are kinder, more progressive, more intelligent, or generally better than other Christians, the rest of the world really doesn't see or care to know the difference. Now, as troubling as this may sound, there is indeed good news. With God, there is always good news. While it is painful to let our grains of power, prestige, and self-image die, they have already begun to bear fruit. When we are no longer so concerned about power and maintaining a false image about who is and who is not among God's beloved, we have been freed to welcome new and more people to the body of Christ. People that we had never thought to welcome before. Those who we formerly called profane or unclean. Though for, though for now the number may be fewer, but we have been free, as we have been freed to be truer to the gospel message, we are becoming more faithful. As for the wider world, a world so troubled and in need of the gospel, despite what it may look like, the world is slowly coming to know God. By God working through us and God working in spite of us, the gospel message is spreading though not always in ways and names that we may immediately recognize. Often we hear lamenting about the state of our youth, that they aren't coming to church anymore, they've lost their sense of morality, that our society is doomed to a bleak future because of it. This, of course, is nonsense, and an excuse by adults to grip tighter onto their power. When teachers, social workers, and others who work regularly with youth were asked what was different about youth today, overwhelmingly they report that youth today are kinder, more empathetic, less inclined to cliques and tribalism, more interested in education, more welcoming to people outside of the usual norms, more interested in justice, and holding one another to a higher standard. That tired trope of kids can be so cruel is becoming less true by the day. And no, many are not yet coming to church, but they are living out the gospel. There's even good news in our troubling infighting. Though we may seem to be more divided than ever, we are holding one another to a higher standard of justice, righteousness, and inclusion. Despite attempts to convince us that we are powerless and that our efforts don't matter, the fact that people on all sides are fighting so hard shows that as a society, we still believe that change for the better is possible. Though we may sharply disagree about what needs to change and how, we have not succumbed to complacency and hopelessness. While there is still a long way to go and much healing to be done, this is the power of the gospel. Even the most troubling circumstances can be redeemed. The world needs the gospel. And it is our mission to be the gospel. What does it mean to be the gospel? It's being the best spouse, 
parent, child, or friend you can be. It's looking for solutions in disputes, and not allowing yourself to be baited into rhetoric meant to win the argument. It's recognizing that you must rely on God and others. We need people who push the boundaries in our common life. We also need people who connect us with tradition. We need people who can be moderators and interme intermediaries between to help make transitions. We need to let the things holding us back, both within us personally and in our society, die so we can be fruitful. In short, we need to be so loving, so welcoming, so good that people take notice. And when they ask us why, we point to Jesus, who for this purpose was lifted up so that all the world may be drawn to him. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. God of hope, help us who struggle in our daily work. When we lose our purpose, renew our hope in you. When we bow to hatred, renew our trust in you. When we despair of bliss, renew our joy in you. When we take offense at others, 
renew our life in you. When we compromise our values, renew our faith in you. When we cherish regrets, renew our freedom in you. When we surrender to despair, renew our hope in you. As we accept your renewing love, we offer our prayers to you. Pray for all those who are committed to parish prayer lists around our diocese. I invite your own intercessions and thanksgivings. Hold us and all people in your loving care, and may we be hope for others. Let us now pray in the words our Savior Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Bow your hearts before the Lord. Keep this your family, Lord, with your never failing mercy, that relying solely on the help of your heavenly grace, they may be upheld by your divine protection through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.